Hello, it's great to welcome you to Melbourne Baptist Church. My name is Stuart Clark and I'm the minister here. And this week we're looking at being empowered to share as the early church did. We have an amazing passage of signs and wonders as the early church gathered and many people believed in the Lord Jesus. The sick were being healed, those with evil spirits, and we encounter an angelic jailbreak for the early church. And the early church cannot be stopped from sharing words, works and wonders. Here are exciting moments that Sylvia will lead us through as she preaches today. Thanks Sylvia for all your hard work and David for reading the Bible. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks go to everyone involved in putting this service together. And later we'll sing, Build Your Life. And this has come from Emily from university and she sent us this song. And the words are at the heart of this service today. They say, open my eyes in wonder and show me who you are. Fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And of course, this is talking of Jesus. And at the heart of sharing the good news of Jesus is God's love. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. This is a love that God shares with the church in Acts as Jesus' ministry continues beyond his resurrection and his ascension through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the early church. And in John 4, 13 and 14, it says this, This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given of his spirit and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the saviour of the world. And uh, we're going to pray now to our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your limitless power, your sovereign will, your glory which envelopes the whole world, for your determination that everyone everywhere will hear and know of your love for them. One of the ways that you bring your love to people is by the empowerment of your church, sharing their lives with folk. And Lord, we praise you. We praise you for the gentle ways that you reach out through folk and you lift the fallen, you heal the broken, and you show mercy to those who long to begin again. We praise you for your truth, which is greater than the mere sum of all human knowledge and for your wisdom that sent your son to seek the lost, bring freedom to those whose lives were captives in hatred, fear, despair, and self-centeredness. And we praise you for your love in Jesus that was prepared to be rejected, abandoned, and abused as we think of the cross. For your love that is freely offered to everyone, everywhere, no matter who they are or what they have done or what they have failed to do. We praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, and through him you have declared the good news of words, works and wonders. We thank you, Jesus, that you are Lord and you are Saviour. Loving God, you are faithful and forgiving. Help us to grasp something of the greatness of your love. Help us to pray honestly now as we make our confession and we seek your forgiveness. In the silence, let's reflect. Where we have failed to love, forgive us and heal us. You are the way, the truth and the life and we praise you Jesus that the relationship we share with you can be shared with others because you are the saviour of the world, the lord of life and the conqueror of death. Father, receive our prayer of praise and so fill us with your Holy Spirit that the praises we offer may be by the power of the Spirit reverberating through the length of our days. 
We ask this through Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. And so let's now sing of the Saviour of the world with Emily. Let's sing. church it's great to be with you again we've got Helen with us today Hello, Hi. Helen. how are you doing Helen through you know this very odd time I know it's been a real challenge isn't it for everyone but um we're all okay and you know just trying to soldier on I guess yeah I mean you have a daughter that's a doctor how she found it well she's um you know she's just come back with a negative covid test this morning actually so that's good that's a relief but um obviously it's it is a challenging time for them all and um but she seems to be keeping positive and i think you know they're yeah keeping you know, things strong. going yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard. and are, are the boys both at home now or is one no one's um living in cambridge now and he works oh. in the lab there and um the other is actually moving to London very soon, so oh, wow. he does live with us at the moment. But um, right, all change in your household yeah, again. All change. Yeah, you I seem know. to you seem to lose your children and then gain them and then oh, lose. This is it? Yeah, they say boomerang children, don't they? It's, um... Yeah, they do indeed. <laughs> uh, now this morning we're talking about the power to share, and um, I thought you are involved with Generate, which is all about sharing the gospel with children. Do you want to explain Generate and your role within that to us as a church? Yeah, so Generate is based in Cambridge and it basically shares a Christian message with primary school age children, either within um, schools or also it does come and um, do things in churches as well on occasion. So it's, um, yeah. but the bit I'm involved in is mostly the assembly work. Okay. So. Yeah, because actually that, I suppose for me, I always think that is generate, it's the assemblies, but actually there's a lot more to it. 
Yeah, yeah, they've done, there's prayer spaces and they do permanent prayer spaces in some schools and... Oh, okay. Yeah, and there's a, a program called um, Cool Choices, which goes and um, talks to year six children about making good life choices. So there is more to yeah, generate than just assembly. Yeah, yeah. but um, any of us with children will remember the assemblies and the different claps. Now, what are a few yeah. claps, Helen? What do you show uh, us your yeah, claps? Yeah, okay, so you have um, a short wave, medium, um, no, sorry, microwave, short wave, medium wave, long wave, low wave, sound on. wave. Shockwave, <laughs> brainwave. <laughs> so many waves, and uh, all our kids know those waves, whatever age they might be. Yeah, um, hopefully. <laughs> how has Generate been affected by lockdown and COVID? Mm, it's been enormously affected because, well, we were, our team was preparing to go into Easter, and of course that had to be shelved because we went, all went into lockdown, and then um, it's from then on we haven't been able to visit school, so... Right everything has changed basically for us so yeah it's been so, a challenge. So, what, so what are you doing because uh, i know you're working very hard with generate what are you doing instead then well so we've um gone virtual we're doing videos for schools now i mean initially we sent, managed to send in an easter video to schools that we couldn't visit right. because um one of the teams had fortunately videoed themselves doing a rehearsal right so that's how it really started at Easter. And then in the summer term, we did um, six more videos for schools locally. And wow. um, well, in yeah. fact, anyone around the world can watch them now because they're online. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're all public all the time, aren't we? I know. That's the yeah. scary thing, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, and then this term, we're doing more videos and more um, sort of reflective um, videos as well. They're now, I was point. amazed that you were saying you're, you're sending something in weekly to schools. Yeah, that's right. At the moment, we're doing a Generate Connect, which is a short 10 minute assembly type video, and then Generate Reflect, which is a very short reflection from one lady who just, you know, talks to children about yeah. that um, more and reflective activity. Right. And, and you were kind of saying it is quite hard to know how much they're being used. So I'm going to say to everyone here, if you know your child has seen Generate this term, why don't you let Helen know? Because she'd love to have some feedback. Is that yeah, right? It would, be a, it would be a real <laughs> encouragement because we do feel like we're doing it a bit in a vacuum, you know, looking at a screen at yourself, which is yeah. awful in itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but you don't know who's watching most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So we all need feedback, don't we? So yeah, so if you've seen Generate, let Helen know and encourage her in that way. Um, yeah. so, so the power to share, I mean, for me, Generate is about sharing the gospel in schools and, and getting that message out and into, you know, children and teachers and then further into families. You know, is that why you got involved or is that, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Um, and originally I got involved because um, we, were pre we were a small group praying for schools and we were wondering how we could take that to the next step and do something practical. And that's how um, Catherine and I and several others got involved locally. And um, yeah. so it's gone from there. But it's not yeah. something I naturally no, think I'm going to do, though, stand yeah. up in front of people. <laughs> So, so you really felt God's power kind of pushing you to do that? Oh, definitely. I just definitely felt led to do this because it's really not in my, you know, gifting to stand up and act. But um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you can say it's not in your gifting because you are, obviously are very good at it. But maybe not in your comfort zone. <laughs> no, maybe that's it. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Actually, God, is, God has given you the... Mm, maybe the, the, the confidence courage, and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. courage to, do it. Mm. to do it excellent well then we're going to hear lots about how we can share the gospel and god's power can enable us to do that i think today but how can we pray for you and for generate helen um as you continue at this point well i think we all um need just that um encouragement and that just that um power of the holy spirit really to just continue faithfully to do what we feel that God is leading us to do yeah totally in these challenging times you know yeah okay let's pray for you then thank you Barbara I thank you for Helen I thank you for all that she does in our church and for the encouragement that she is and for the worker that she is I know she does so much admin for us she's on the deacons she's 
you know, now part of the secretarial team. She does so much for her and she faithfully serves you. And I thank you for that. And I do just pray that you would encourage her today and, and through the next few weeks, Father, I pray that, um, yeah, you would be her strength and you would fill her afresh with your spirit so that she knows your presence continuing to guide her. And, uh, and I pray for her family as well, that you would keep them safe. I thank you for that negative test of Hannah's. And I, I just pray that you would protect her in her frontline role, Father. And for Helen's whole family, I pray your protection on them. And uh, yeah, keep them safe, we ask. And Father, we do lift Generate up to you. I thank you for all that they do. I thank you for the message that they're taking into schools. And Father, at this time where it's so tough, when... Um, they can't physically do that. I thank you that they're still faithfully recording videos and putting YouTube links in. And I just pray that you would bless those. And I pray that schools would take them and use them and your message would continue to reach um, children's and families and teachers' lives, Father. And I pray that um, Helen would be encouraged and get feedback and the teams would be encouraged to get feedback from uh, schools and from parents and families. Um, but Father, we just pray for your protection and we pray that your message will go into the hearts of all these children and continue to do that. And I thank you that this mission has been able to continue. I ask that you would bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank thank you. you so much for um, uh, coming on this interview. <laughs> it's been great you. to talk to you today. <laughs> we'll say goodbye to everybody in church. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring And you're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus And Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Cause holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Oh, but not my eyes. Show me who you are and fill me with your love and lead me in your love to those around me. Our reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 5, and we read from verses 12 to 25. The apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. 
Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to preach to the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there, so they went back and reported. We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were puzzled, wondering what would come of this. Then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts, teaching the people. Last week, Stuart was talking about sharing ministry. This week, we're looking at the early church as well, and we're looking at the subject of empowered to share. We came back from the beach a week ago, where we had basked in the sunshine. It was just Norfolk, of course, but it had been really lovely. Not so lovely, however, when it came time to come home, packing the car in a gale was dreadful. It was about 60 miles an hour, I think, and the rain was lashing down. It was very strange to accept that in just a few hours, the weather had changed completely. When we arrived home, the house felt quite chill, so we lit a fire as quickly as we could. With a flick of a match, friction occurs and a spark leaps from match to tinder. A small flame burns the edges, and grows, fueled by wood and air. Heat builds, and soon the kindling, or as in our case, the pine cones, are licked by reddish-orange tongues. Higher and wider it spreads, consuming the wood. Now the flame has become a fire. Well, nearly 2,000 years ago, a match was struck in Palestine. At first, just a few in that corner of the world were touched and warmed. But the fire spread beyond Jerusalem and Judea, out to the world and to all people. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we heard from our reading, the apostles were performing miraculous signs in the temple, which was in spite of severe opposition from the temple leaders. They had prayed back in chapter 4 this very prayer. And now, Lord, look upon their threats 
and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word in all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now, the word for signs means a mark or token given to point people to God. And the word wonders has to do with a response to these signs. And these signs were done by the hands of the apostles. We are seeing here, now that Jesus has gone, how healing and mercy is coming through the hands of the apostles. And these miraculous signs were designed to authenticate the authority of the apostles, as we see in 2 Corinthians, when it says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. Mark's Gospel tells us that these signs and wonders also verified the message of the Gospel and were not to be sought out for their own sake but rather to point people to Jesus. And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Now, I have it on good authority that the word signs is mentioned in the book of Acts 17 times, as people are being led to being saved, which is very much in line with what Jesus said in John 4, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. How well he knew us. The apostles were in the colonnade, which was on the eastern side of the temple. King Herod had built this colonnade in order to endear himself to the Jewish people. Well, the apostles met each other there. They had a commitment to gather with each other. They were all together in the temple. It was their place of worship. It was an interesting area of the temple and the apostles were undoubtedly in close proximity to the same religious leaders who had conspired to put Jesus to death. Well COVID-19 has stopped our meeting regularly and millions of other Christians like us. It's been very strange and we've all had to develop new habits for Sundays. Some of us are able to use Zoom or Facebook to follow the services. Well, it's great, but it's not perfect. We can't sing, we can't share, we can't have fellowship in our usual way. I think there are some, perhaps, who feel that this doesn't really matter. They feel that they can maintain their faith without all these things. But we can't, indefinitely. We need to be church. Even before the pandemic, church attendance, even by evangelical Christians, was declining. John Stott said this, an unchurched Christian is a grotesque anomaly. The New Testament knows nothing of such a person. For the church lies at the very centre of the eternal purpose of God, it is not a divine afterthought. It is not an accident of history. The church is God's new community. Well, since David and I haven't been able to attend our new Sunday goes something like this. We wake up to listen to the 810 service on Radio 4. Then we get up. Whilst having breakfast, we listen to Premier Radio and quite often the sermon on there given by Rick Warren from Saddleback Church. We then tune into our own service at Melbourne, which brings us very neatly to Zoom coffee time. And then we follow that with songs of praise on the television whilst preparing our lunch. All these new habits help us to keep Sunday separate and very special from other days of the week. But we're not actually meeting together as the first Christians did. And we really do need each other because we are the church. We are God's community. Well, going back to our scripture passage, the apostles are busy. We hear that they are preaching, teaching and healing and all in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, while the Pharisees were the predominant group that attacked Jesus, it is the Sadducees who take aim at the followers of Jesus. And the Sadducees were very wealthy because they controlled all the finances surrounding the temple sacrifices. They were the religious liberals of the day. They valued rationalism and ritualism, and they didn't believe in angels, and they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. That was a joke. So the apostles were performing amazing miraculous signs among the people. Now, it would be usual for discussion and debate to take place in this area of the temple. And Jesus had preached and healed there himself. Yet no one dared to argue at all with the apostles. They were now so respected. It says that more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord, both men and women. The sick were also brought for healing. The wealthy came on their couches or were brought on their couches and the poor were brought on their mats. So all in fact, it's quite a wonderful picture, isn't it? Verse 15 paints the picture of the streets filled with the sick and the suffering. They had all been carried outside in the hope that Peter's shadow might just pass over them. Now, we know that Peter's shadow had no power without God's power working through him. But anyhow, all were healed. And the word sick doesn't just refer to physical illnesses. Apparently, although it does certainly include physical ailments, it also describes those who are vacillating in faith, doubting, weak, powerless and without strength. And the word afflicted means to be harassed and helpless. Plus the word for healed also means to serve others. And once people were set free, they were able to serve others. So we are reminded here that we are saved to serve. God comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's Paul, 2 Corinthians. How do we add up now as followers of Christ here? How similar are we to those early apostles? They had very special powers from the Holy Spirit at that time. Should and do we expect to have the same power from the Holy Spirit now? And they were on fire for their Lord. Their enthusiasm was boundless. Of course, they were seeing the miracles of healing, etc., which helps to keep them on fire. But when did we last witness answer to our prayers? How long ago was it? Today? Maybe yesterday? Are we even struggling now to remember? I can think of many occasions when we as a corporate body of Christ have come together and have asked for healing and it has been given. When both young and old have come together in our own place of worship, we have been one band of believers, a brotherhood in Christ, a band of disciples, a church. What makes Christianity attractive to people now? <clears throat> it is easy for us to be drawn to churches because of good programs, good speakers, size, beautiful facilities, or fellowship, or even more latterly, good application of the way that services are handled online. But then, people were attracted to the very early church by expressions of God's power at work, the generosity, sincerity, honesty and unity of the members, and the character of the leaders. Have the standards of God's church slipped? God wants to add believers to his church now. COVID is giving us some help here in that people are questioning the meaning of their life. Some are even watching online services because it's easier than stepping into the church building. I spent the first 15 years of my life living in the shadow of an enormous Baptist church. It never entered my mind to join in any of the youth programs or the Sunday school. Nothing. The building just happened to be there. I had to be invited in before I really noticed it. You know the rest. I heard the gospel. I heard about Jesus. 
I thought, why has nobody told me about this before? I became a Christian. Who should we invite to share our services with? We need to pray for that same flame to ignite in our hearts. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in this and expect to be answered. Verse 17 tells us the high priest and his friends who were Sadducees reacted with violent jealousies. Too right they were jealous. The apostles were already commanding more respect than they had ever received. The difference, however, was that the religious leaders demanded respect and reverence for themselves. The apostles' goal was to bring respect and reverence for God. So, verse 18, the apostles collectively were arrested and they were thrown into the public prison. All of them this time, not just Peter and John, as it happened in the previous chapter of Acts. And it was all done very publicly, so that everybody in the temple would see. Now, this is where I think that God enjoys a bit of a joke. Remember how the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection and angels? Well then, so God sends an angel to open the gates of the prison to let them out. Miraculous. Well, this must have been quite an amazing event, but there was no time for the apostles to linger in awe. They were to return to the temple and give the people this message of life. And so they did, immediately. After a sleepless night, no doubt, they were there as soon as the sun was up. The message given to them by the angel was the same as in Matthew, to go, go, make disciples of all nations, give them the meaning of life. Many people came to the temple early at sunrise to pray and worship. The apostles therefore continued preaching to the many early risers that morning. Meanwhile, it says in verse 21, the high priest, having absolutely no idea that they weren't still all nicely locked up in the prison, called a meeting of anybody important in the land in order to put the apostles to trial. He called the Sanhedrin, 70 men in all. This was to be a big trial. The religious leaders would do anything to protect their standing and their authority. And anything which might threaten their secure position and expose their hypocritical motives to the people would certainly have to be stopped. Finally, when everybody was assembled, the high priest sends for the apostles. The guards on duty at the prison have absolutely no idea that they are not actually guarding anybody any longer. So there is general consternation and confusion when they realise that the prison is now quite empty. They do a thorough search. Then, of course, the temple guards have to report back. They say... In verse 23, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. There is now complete confusion and alarm, but no apparent suspicion that anything spiritual could have occurred. Then someone reports back to them, the apostles are actually already back in the temple preaching. Suppose someone threatened to kill us if we wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. Might we be tempted to keep quiet? I will just mention here some facts and figures of the many who suffer daily from this very persecution. I have a list here from the Open Doors Watch List for last year. It says that in 2019, more than 260 million Christians, now my maths isn't good, but I'm told that's one in every eight believers, experience high levels of persecution. A total of 9,488 places of worship were attacked. 3,711 Christians were detained without trial, sentenced and imprisoned. And 2,983 followers of Christ were killed for faith-related reasons. This is a very modern persecution. And the number one request from those who are persecuted is for us to pray for them. Exactly the same as Paul did in 2 Thessalonians, when he said, Finally, brothers, pray for us, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honoured, as happened among you, and that we may be delivered, delivered from wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, 
He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. In this country, we are still fortunate so far as the church is concerned. Individually, however, if that little flame is burning bright and we are on fire to bring others to a knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, then we will have to expect a certain amount of persecution ourselves. The persecution that the early Christians experienced meant that as the Christians spread from Jerusalem towards Rome and the surrounding area, their flames became a fire, a fire which spread to all the world and right down through all the ages to you and to me. Their empowerment to do wonderful things came from the Holy Spirit of God living with each, in each one of them. The Bible tells us that our empowerment comes from the Holy Spirit of God living within each one of us. Amen. And this song is great that we're going to respond to Sylvia's sermon with. It's perfect for it. It's called Let the Flame Burn Brighter, as Sylvia talked about the flame burning bright across the world. So let's sing this together. short intercession where we will pray for the empowerment of the spirit and for the flame to burn brighter across our world so let us pray God of kindness you gave your only son because you loved us so much and we pray for the peace of the world at this time of pandemic May you move among the nations by your spirit, break down barriers of racism, fear, suspicion, hatred. At this time, countries need to work together to be unified against the coronavirus. It's only in you, Lord, that we can see the healing of the nations, of the human family being healed of its divisions. It's you that can unite us through the bonds of justice and peace at this difficult time, Lord. 
We pray for the empowerment, the spirit and for the flame to burn brighter across this world. We pray for our country, enrich our common life, strengthen the forces of truth and goodness at a time that requires us to conform to restrictions for the safety of all. Be with our government as they make tough decisions and lead us through this pandemic, Lord, so that we might be closer and closer to you. We pray for those who suffer at this time. Surround them with your love, support them with your strength, console them with your comfort and give them hope and courage beyond themselves. We pray for the empowerment of the spirit and for the flame to burn brighter and brighter across this world. We pray for our families, for those whom we love. God, please protect them, support them in these times and of difficulty and anxiety, that we may be close in mutual love, empathy and relationship, even if we can't see them directly with us. May we be close to our family at this time. We pray for the church to share the good news of Jesus with words, works and wonders. Lord, we pray for the persecuted church across the world. And Lord, may their suffering be a powerful witness and we recognise in persecution that the church grows and so we pray for the empowerment of the spirit and for the flame to burn brighter and brighter across this world and we pray for the fire of empowerment to share, to spread the gospel across this world. May the church share the saving power of Jesus by witness, by worship and lives empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now we'll come to a time where we'll share blessing. A blessing. The Saviour who called us is the Lord who sends us. The Lord who sends us is the Spirit who empowers us. The Spirit who empowers us is the Christ who is with us always. And so let's go in the name of Jesus to glorify the Lord. Amen. Amen. And let's now finish our service by joining with Pauline and singing in Christ alone that reminds us that we, we can stand in the power of Christ, the Holy Spirit's power empowering us to share good news. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song this cornerstone, this solid ground, bowed through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are spilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Here in the 
from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since God has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of